All right, Uma Fikan. Um, this video, I'm going to warn you, uh, is not going to be politically correct. Um, not that any of the other videos have been, but there are certain terms that people don't want to use. Um, and because they don't want to use them, because they don't really sound too good, uh, they don't use them. Uh, I'm going to have to use them in this video, okay? Uh, next, I want to say that until I pick up steam, uh, I may bore you a little bit, all right? Eventually, I'll pick up steam. Uh, my words uh, will start to come together. My thoughts will come together, and it'll be a little more exciting for you. I'm going to try to keep it short, but it may not be as short as I would want it to be, or maybe you would want it to be. So I recommend that if you get a little bored, uh, that you pause it and come back. Remember where you, you left off and then come back. This video has to be done because over a period of three years there's been some disagreements and I realize that disagreements are part and partial of just having opinions. But the fact of the matter is, is what I'm going to say in this video will help everyone understand exactly why I have been dismissive of some things why I will continue to be dismissive of some things, and what I mean when I talk about a fighter, all right? Now, um, I'm, I'm going to say this, that when I talk about boxers and I talk about fighters, I use the terms interchangeably. That is a sin on my part, because I don't mean to do that, but as a habit, I have used it. Most people do do that. I will probably continue to use boxers and fighters interchangeably, all right, until I can actually get used to distinguishing between the two. That's not to say fighters don't box or boxers don't fight, but they are not to be used really if you're conscious interchangeably, all right? Not saying again that I will get out of that habit in a day or two or even a month or two, but they are not the same. In this video, what I'm going to do is point out what a fighter is and what a boxer is. All right? Now, I'm not saying what an MMA fighter is, but I'm saying what a boxer is or maybe what a wrestler is. All right? And you'll understand what I mean with that. I'm going to tell you people who are fighters. I'm going to tell you why I support certain things and I don't support other things. All right? uh, but at the end of this video, you will understand the difference between the two. First, to, to get you up to speed, I want to just explain something very shortly uh, as to what happened to me as a youngster. More of it will be uh, in the book. You can actually, as I said, if you want information on the book, you can contact me, no problem, by the, the, um, the uh, uh, email that we provide after every video. All right? Uh, we're not going to come out and say, hi, everybody, we're Uma Fight Camp. You know, I understand that that's what a lot of people like, all right? Most of these books you read, these books on advertising and marketing, they tell you that's what you should do. That's not our personality. You're not going to get that. We try to provide you with information to contact us by. If you don't use it, if you don't use it, then you're not going to find out a lot of, a lot of things that we have going on. All right? You're just not going to do it. So if you're waiting for us to, you know, act like used car salesmen and do a tap dance, say hi, everybody, or dress up like, you know, you know, a Superman, Superwoman, it's not going to happen. All right. It's not going to happen. We try to provide you with a service, but we provide you with a service from an authentic position. All right. That's our position. What you see in front of this camera all right, bad lighting at all, most of bad lighting at all, most of the time. The good lighting we actually took to the school so we can get these your downloads prepared for you. All right, but bad lighting at all. The fact of the matter is, you know, is that this is what we are. All right, we do what we do from the kindness of our heart because we're basically one of the last people in our generation who will give you this kind of information, who's willing to stand before the camera and actually take all the criticism that we take, all right? So if you want information on things, umacamp at yahoo.com will be the best way to get it, okay? So I just want to tell you a few things, basically what, as a child, and bring you up to speed as to uh, when I came to understand what fighting is, I will give you some names as to who are fighters and whatever. So here we go. Um, the person you see in front of the camera is not the person that was I was as a little boy. 
All right, it's hard for people to believe, but I was one of those people, like Mike Tyson, like Sugar Ray Leonard, that was really traumatized by bullying. Traumatized by bullying. You have people who, you know, my age, 53, 54, who were tough as kids. And you always hear people say, oh, he would fight anybody when he was 11. He would fight anybody when he was 12. All right? I'm not ashamed to say I wasn't that dude. All right? I, I was not. I come from a very loving family. Not saying that other people don't who were tough as kids, but I'm saying my mother, my father, I knew who my father was. I didn't live with him. I saw him regularly, but I lived with my mother. My mother was a very, very, very gentle individual until you got on her bad side. And it wasn't really in her to say, okay, you have to fight. Your son, you know, telling her son, you have to do this and you have to do that. All right? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that when I was younger, from 9 to about 12, my mother would send me to the store. The store was not far from the housing project we lived in. But there was an abandoned lot. There was an abandoned lot that separated our building from the supermarket. And whenever I would be asked to go to the store by my mother, I would run to the living room window and look out from the fifth floor and look at that abandoned lot. Where I could, From the fifth floor, you get a very, very good view of that lot. And I would look. And the reason is because almost without fail, the same three or four guys, same three or four kids around my age, from 9 to about 12, they would actually wait until I was in the middle of that lot, too far to run to the store, too far to run back home and take whatever money I had. I remember the, the, the sum of $1.11. And the reason why I remember $1.11 is because that's what a loaf of Wonder Bread cost, a brand, you know, a good brand, name brand. Um, even though we were on a fixed income, we always had name brand foods, right? The best foods. Uh, and it was a loaf of bread, Wonder Bread, that was $1.11. Now, if they caught me going to the store, they would take the money. If they caught me coming back, whatever goodies my mother would purchase for me and my sisters, uh, my younger sisters, um, they would eat them. Uh, the canned goods they would just throw around, whatever. The bread, they might have a slice of bread, but on the average, they would just open the bread and throw it out and feed the birds with it. All right? And that's really the re that was what the reality was for me as a child. One day, one day, a lady by the name of Miss Gussie, a nice, nice lady, uh, one of the ringleaders, I'll call him Ray, right, because he's probably still around, so I'll just say Ray. Ray cursed at Miss Gussie. Now, Ray was one of the guys that I was afraid of the most of that, that particular ring. Uh, but I remember being upset when he cursed at Miss Gussie. Miss Gussie. So when we finally put on the gloves, we went to the park. I told you my brother and uh, uh, uncle of mine and a cousin would take me to, to the park and teach me how to box and have me spar with other kids to get me over the, the fright of uh, the, the crippling fear that I suffered from as a child. Well, when I finally, when we got to the park, uh, it was asked who wanted to box with me, and Ray quickly put up his hand. Now, here's a kid that until he cursed at Miss Gussie, I was definitely afraid of this kid. My same height, my same height, you know, average height at that time. I'm below average height now, but average height at that time, um, same age, couldn't have been more than a year older than me, but I was afraid of that kid. Loud mouth, everything. Had brothers who tore him out of box, just afraid of him. But I was mad that he had cursed out Miss Gussie. I lost my temper at the one, one of the few instances where I lost my temper and showed some courage. I just started going wild on the guy, and he hit me with four punches, flush on top of the head, flush on top of the head. And I hit him with a haymaker back, but there's something that happened to me. All of my life prior to that age of about 12, I had thought that getting hit with gloves fist, glove fist actually hurt. I thought it actually hurt. But I was amazed that it didn't hurt. It didn't cause pain. I had known pain. I had slammed my finger in a car window, in a car door. I had hit my, my foot against a, a metal uh, bed post. That was painful. I had bit down on my tongue because, you know, enthusiastically hitting, eating something that I liked. I bit my tongue. We, most of us have done that. That was painful. But getting hit in the head, with four punches on, you know, on top of the head in this region, on the crown, it didn't hurt. And I had an aha moment right then. But then, when I hit him with that haymaker, 
I had another Eureka moment. In that same match, I had another Eureka moment that helped to change my life and change my approach to, to fighting. When he saw that I didn't go down, or he saw that it didn't really affect me when he hit me with those four punches, and I actually hit him back with a haymaker, I saw how most of the fight went out of him. Most of the fight went out of him not because he, because I hit him, but because I didn't go down from what he hit me with. And prior to 12, I really didn't know about the mental the mental game, how, how the mentality of fighters come into play or the mentality of boxers or wrestlers come into play when they're being matched up. But I learned two things then at 12 that helped to shape the person that's in front of this camera now, and that was that it really didn't hurt. It was more like pressure. Pressure, like taking your palm and hitting the top of your head. It's pressure. It's not really pain as you generally know pain to be. I realized that, and then I also realized that it's not always a tone that is set by your offense, but many times a tone is set by your defense and your defensive approach, your stern stance to being hit, your stern stance to when you take, when you take a defensive mode. And I realized those two things, but then something else happened. I was around 13 years old and I was matched with another kid. And again, after I realized that getting hit with glove fists actually didn't hurt, I still remain a coward in many ways. I wasn't afraid of Ray, but I was afraid of everyone else. So it really didn't do the trick, although those two things did go into making me the individual I became. Eventually, at 13, I had a boxing match with another kid who had done something, violated some kind of rule that I thought uh, he shouldn't have done, and the fright that I had of him went out the window. We went back and forth. Neither We didn't like each other. We went back and forth. Not a whole lot of skill. Not a whole lot of skill. I bloodied him. He bloodied me. Eventually, the grown-ups looked and realized we were tired and we were getting sloppy and they broke it up. But then something happened. I looked at him. And when I looked at him, he kind of grinned. Now, when other people had beaten me up, when other kids had beaten me up, you could see that they were happy that they did it, but they really didn't grin. They would tell everybody in the neighborhood that they had done it, but they really didn't grin. But he looked at me and he grinned. His nose was bleeding. Blood is running into his mouth. He was bleeding. But he grinned at me. And at that point, I don't know what happened, but I grinned. Now, my gums were bleeding. They weren't, my teeth weren't knocked out, but they were bleeding from biting down on the mouthpiece, as they still do now. And I started grinning. We kind of looked at each other and started grinning with blood in my mouth and blood on his nose running into his mouth. And I realized at 13, the one thing that was going to actually get me and help me at least transcend my lack of height and my lack of weight at that time. And that was this. And this is what a lot of people will cringe at. I realized at 13 that more than a right hand, more than a left hook, the one thing that I had going for myself was a love for violence. Now, there are some people saying, oh my God, how could he say that? I didn't say a love for beating people up. I didn't say a love for killing people. I didn't say a love for even watching when people are killed on television. I hate watching it. My wife would tell you, I don't like, really like to watch those gory things. But indulging in violent acts with another individual who is at least, has at least 50-50 chance of beating me as I have of beating him is something at 13 I realized that I liked. And I did it not to beat people up. I liked it for what it said about me. For what it said about me. Not winning or losing, but what it said about me. Because to a fighter, winning and losing is just something that happens. Okay, winning is something that happens as a as a result of you pushing yourself, as a result of you testing yourself, as a result of seeing how far you can go. So that's what a fighter is. A fighter is an individual, man or woman, but we're talking about men here. A fighter is an individual who indulges in controlled or uncontrolled violent acts with the best competition as a means of competing against oneself 
and for what it does for that person existentially. Okay, again, a fighter is someone who competes against himself, not someone else, competes against himself and for what it does for him, what it says about him to himself. Okay? A fighter is not one that wants to beat people up. In fact, a fighter who beats people up gets bored. Why? Because it's about pushing himself. If you can constantly beat people up, you're not pushing yourself. Now, there are some people that may look and say, yeah, 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 okay. Well, let me get your attention. Nine out of ten people who think they are fighters are not fighters. No. What they want, what they want are the odds firmly in their favor that they're going to win the fight. That's not a fighter. A fighter does not look for people they can beat and then say, I want to fight that person. Because that doesn't say anything about yourself. The only time you fight and it says something about yourself is when the person in front of you is just as capable of knocking you out as you are of knocking that person out. And then when you don't get knocked out, not that you knock them out, but when that person pushes you to a certain threshold, it's what it says about your character. It's what it says about your fortitude that keeps you fighting. If someone raises your hand and say the winner, then that's good. That's cherry on a cake. But the reason a fighter fights is because they are addicted to the act of violence and pushing themselves against someone who can push back for what it says about that individual. And this is why when you look at boxing today, boxing lacks fighters. And this is why when you look at the average boxing fan, the average male boxing fan has no idea what a fighter is. They will say Gennady Konovkin is a fighter. Gennady Konovkin is an aggressive opponent against people he knows he can beat. If Gennady Konovkin was a fighter, no manager, HBO, no one could have stopped him from forcing them to match him with Andre Ward. That is what a fighter is. And that's why I support the UFC. Now, I have a problem with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, in my opinion, is not very qualified. He is the least qualified person I can think of to be a commentator for the UFC. Why? Because he only has experience in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He doesn't have much experience in anything else, and that fake karate he did was ridiculous. You can't say somebody really is an expert in karate if the kind of karate they're indulging in is one where you can't punch to the face. All right? And Dana White. Dana White, in my opinion, is extremely, is extremely bigoted in many issues and, is, and really is, is extremely biased. In other words, he's really a creep. He's not a nice guy. All right. But the UFC is something I support. And there are people who have come up with me in, in traditional karate who blast the UFC. I don't like the UFC. There are people who box. I hate the UFC. No, I love the UFC. And I'm not saying I just love the UFC. I love mixed martial arts. But the UFC is a Super Bowl of mixed martial arts. So that's what I'm talking about. I love the UFC. I will only purchase maybe one fight a year. Of the UFC, I'm not. The card has to be good for me to spend six, six, sixty dollars to see it. It has to be at least three good fights on the undercard. All right, but I watch just about every good fight in the UFC. Why? Because they are fighters. They are fighters. When a fighter loses in the UFC, look at them. How traumatized are many of these fighters? Are they really traumatized, or some of them may, may be mildly disappointed? You know why they're mildly disappointed and they really don't get really too traumatized on the average when they lose? Because of what the fight says about themselves. Because what bleeding, what bleeding, having a face full of blood and not wanting to quit, what it says about yourself. Wanting, having someone in front of you who hits like a truck and kicks like a truck. And yet you are not taking a backward step looking for an exit. What does that say about you? What does it say about an individual who when you know you can beat someone, you say, nah, I'm not interested in that. I want that person, that undefeated person. What does it say about you? When you see Robbie Lawler and Rory McDonald, the last round, faces full of blood, look like somebody hit him in the face with a pizza. And they're looking at each other. And I don't know if it's Joe McCarthy or the other guy, right? Or Herb, right? But they're looking at each other, smiling. Smiling with faces full of blood. You will not see that in boxing. Why? Because Robbie Lawler 
and Rory McDonald, did they want to win? Of course they wanted to win. What? Why? Because it means more money. It means a bigger career. It means a next fight. It means a shot at this or a shot at that. It means endorsements, of course. But they were smiling because of what it said about themselves to be indulging in an act of violence that will make other men cringe. Not just women, other men cringe. That's what a fighter is. Why would BJ Penn, after a particularly difficult fight, not lick his blood off, of glove, off his gloves, but lick another man's blood off of his gloves like a vampire? Why would BJ Penn do that? Now, he didn't do this in 1800s. He wasn't around 1800s, 1700s. No, he did this in 2000 something. 2014, 2015. The man licked another man's blood off of his gloves in a frenzy. You will not see that in boxing. That's a fighter. That's a fighter. Even the women, they fight. Why? Because fighting at, the, at that caliber, their hands, knees against people who are trained to render you unconscious. In a venue, because keep in mind, the UFC does not have gimme fights. You will not have many mismatches on purpose in the UFC. No one knew Conor McGregor would knock out Jose Aldo with one punch. Look at that matchup. Look at that matchup. I have my issues with Dana White. But one thing for sure, Dana White is into making money. Conor McGregor fights Mendez, Chad Mendez, right? Now, before that, he didn't fight many great fighters, but he fights Chad Mendez, and then he's matched with Jose Aldo. Next, he's fighting Junior DeSantos. Now, Dana White didn't say, well, a lot of white people are watching Conor McGregor. I don't want to get Conor McGregor knocked off. No, he wants Conor McGregor to fight the best fights because it's making money. If Dana White was in charge of boxing, then there's no way Gennady Gennuffkin could get out of fighting Andre Ward. He would demand that he fought Andre Ward. He would demand that he fought Andy Lee. That's what fighting is about. That's what fighting is about. Fighting is when you are indulging in an act of violence, controlled or uncontrolled. I'm not saying taking knives and cutting people. I am saying it might be. It might be. People, maybe, who indulge in knife fights back in the 1800s, 1700s. Indulge in knife fights against the other trained knife fighter. That will fall into it. If someone's a great sword fighter and they're fighting another one who's a great sword fighter, that will fall into it. Of course, the outcome is fatal. You're not coming back for rematches. But a gunfighter, he's a gunfighter. He wants to match his gun against the fastest, the, a person considered to be faster than him. That's also what I'm talking about. That's what a fighter is. They are competing against themselves, not the individual in front of them. Winning is not what's on their mind. Winning is just a result. It's just a result. It's just a byproduct of pushing yourself and wanting to see how far you can push yourself for what it says about the man in the mirror. It's not winning or losing. Some of my proudest moments have been when I lost, but I stood up against somebody who was much bigger than me and was supposed to beat me. That's some of my proudest moments. Why? Because I know the average guy is not going to spar anybody 10, uh, 90 pounds heavier than them. I know the average guy who runs his mouth all day today is not going to spar somebody who's 7 inches taller than him. I know the average man 5'7 ain't going to spar somebody who's 230 pounds, who's 6'3". They can run their mouths, but I know people walking around tough all right here in Noah that will never fight anybody who has them outweighed by 100 pounds or has them or 7 inches taller than them. But they'll run their mouth all the time. I know I did it. So it's not a case of even winning and losing to a fighter. A fighter wants to indulge in violence, mano a mano, with another man because of what it says about him when he looks in the mirror and he sees him. What it says about his character. What it says about his fortitude. And then if he wins, then that's fantastic. Good. But winning and losing is a cheap shot. In the book I will talk about. Winning and losing, you tell me you want to win. So what? You're just telling me something that is right there. You're preaching to the choir. You're just telling me something that is innate about the human being. The human being wants to be a winner and wants to be on a winning team because it comes with so much fanfare. We want to be loved. We want to be liked. That, to tell me you want to win doesn't mean anything. What are you willing to do to win? If someone says, okay, I want my own business, it doesn't tell me what, anything about you. You want your own business. Doesn't, I don't know anything about you until you tell me you're willing to work 16 hours a day to run your own business. 
When you tell me you want to be your own business, you want to be in your own business, and you want to be your own boss, you're just telling me something that is innate to the average human being. That's it. That's it. Simple. I don't need you to tell me that. But fighting is different than boxing. Fighting is different than boxing. You have fighters who fight, and you have boxers who box, but fighting is not boxing. Today, today, the greatest boxer of your generation, of this current, gener this current generation, is none other than Floyd Mayweather, of course. The best boxer, the greatest boxer. The greatest fighter of this generation is Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao. He's the greatest fighter of this generation. Why? Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao was knocked on his face, clean on his face, and he got up. when he got up and he came to, he was smiling. Many of you didn't understand, oh, he must be punch drunk. No. When did Manny Pacquiao smile? He smiles after a fight, he smiles before a fight, he smiles even during a fight. He smiles when he wins and he smiles when he loses. Why? Because whether he wins or loses, Manny Pacquiao loves what it says about him. Manny Pacquiao can look in the mirror at himself with all his Lamborghinis, with all his money, and say, I like that guy. That guy in that mirror has cojones. That guy in that mirror has testicular fortitude. That guy in that mirror has courage. That guy in that mirror has character. That's why Manny fights. That's why he smiles. For what it says about him. If you say, okay, the winner is and still or the new one is Manny Pacquiao, yes, he loves it. But he's smiling because he's engaging in an art at a certain degree. He's going to a violent threshold where most men are afraid to go. That's why. That's why. Manny Pacquiao was knocked out on his face. And when he came to, they asked him, what happened? He said with a smile, I got hit. That's what happens when you fight. Yet all you guys in your barbershops, all you guys out in front of 7-Eleven, you said he got knocked the F out. Manny didn't care what you said because Manny knew you weren't a fighter. That's why you said that. The fact of the matter is that Manny simply said when you are a fighter, you run the risk. And when you're my kind of fighter and you're aggressive, you run the risk of running into a punch and that's what happened. And then to show you that he didn't care, he asked Juan Manuel Marquez to give him a fifth fight. And Juan Manuel Marquez refused, as he should have. Why? Because Manny was moving in for a kill, moving in for the kill in that fourth fight. And actually, he was getting beat worse in that fourth fight before he caught that punch, before he threw that punch. It wasn't a lucky punch, it was a clear punch. Manny leans in, Juan Manuel Marquez threw his Hail Mary punch, and it worked. But the fact of the matter is, is that Manny Pacquiao asked him for a rematch. He's the greatest fighter of this generation. And while I'm on Manny Pacquiao, what fighter do many of you say? What fighter do many of you say is the one who beat him? Three out of, two, three out of four times. We know we beat him one time out of four times, but at least three out of four times. Where's the one fighter? Juan Manuel Marquez. Why did Manny Pacquiao want to fight him four times? Well, want to fight him five times and fought him four times. Understand this. Other than the first fight, Manny Pacquiao was a drawing card for the other fights. He was a drawing card for the other fights. Now, Juan Manuel Marquez is, over, is underrated. He is underrated and very much underappreciated. And it's a shame because like Larry Holmes was in the shadow of Ali, Marquez was in the shadow of, of Manny Pacquiao. But the fact of the matter is, is Manny Pacquiao sold those particular fights. He was the attraction in those particular fights. And all but the first fight. Why would he want to fight the one guy who was truly his nemesis, who many of you say was better than him? Who many of you say had his number? Who many of you say beat him? Because he's a fighter. He wasn't trying to beat Marquez. He wanted the best opposition to be in front of him, to push himself so he could look in the mirror and say, I, Manny Pacquiao, I have testicular fortitude. I, Manny Pacquiao, I have cojones. And if he ended up winning, good. But what he wanted to do was push himself through the blood, through the pain, through the snot, through the slob. That's what he wanted to do because he knew the average man didn't have the cojones to do it. That's why. That's what a fighter is. A fighter gets bored winning all the time. A fighter wants to match. If a fighter wins too much, he says, get me somebody better. I need to be pushed. And many of you need to understand when I say a fighter, that's what I'm talking about. A fighter looks at somebody who everyone fears and says, I want that person. 
I don't want to beat that person. I want to see how well I stand up against that person because everybody else has fell for, under the hands of that person, under the sword of that person, under from the gun of that person, under the blade of that person, under the bat of that person, under the kick of that person. I want to see if I can hold myself up against that person. That's what a fighter does. If they win, good. If they don't win, good. No, nope, it doesn't matter. They want to be able to look at themselves and say, I did it where everybody else failed. That's what a fighter is. That's what a fighter is. Floyd Mayweather, the best generation, best boxer of our generation. He gets ready to retire. He fights Andre Berto. Name one fighter who between the junior welterweight and welterweight division is sure to give you hell. Name one fighter between the junior welterweight and the welterweight division is sure to give you hell. Timothy Bradley. And who was fighting Timothy Bradley for the third time in his last fight? The greatest fighter of this generation. Man, uh, Manuel or Emmanuel Manuel Pacquiao, the greatest fighter of this generation. Fighters are fighters who want to fight the best. Even if you think they're a boxer, they're fighters. Muhammad Ali, you think boxing? You think fighting? No, you think boxing. Why would this man want to fight Joe Fazer three times? He wants to fight Joe Fazer three times, and he fought Joe Fazer all three times after his prime because his prime, 25, 26, 27, and 28, were taken away from him. Why would he fight a, a killer? The heavyweight Pac-Man Pacquiao of his day was Joe Fazer. Why would Muhammad Ali want to fight him three times to push himself? Why would he fight Ken Norton to push himself? Ken Norton broke his jaw in his first fight. Why would he fight him two more times to push himself? This is what it's about, people. Sugar Ray Leonard fought Roberto Duran the first time, and Roberto Duran hit him so hard with the right hand, Sugar Ray said, it pushed four of his front teeth back in his gum. He had to get surgery to pull his front teeth out to, re to redo his mouth. And yet he fought Roberto Duran two more times after that. Now, did he, afford, did he, did he, did he avoid Marvin Hagler? Yes, and why is he so? And I'll never forgive Sugar Ray Leonard for doing that. Hagler lost that fight, but I'll never forget Sugar, forgive Sugar Ray Leonard for doing that because he didn't want any part of Hagler in his prime, and he knows it. But he did fight with Roberto Duran. He fought him three times, his nemesis. Why would he want to fight Thomas Hearns, a born killer? Why would he want to fight the hardest puncher of all time, pound for pound, and Thomas Hearns? Why would he want to fight him again? Why? Because fighters want to push themselves. No matter where you find it. Jake LaMotta, he lost to Sugar Ray Robinson. He lost so bad to Sugar Ray Robinson on that particular February 14th of that particular year, they called it the Valentine's Day Massacre. And Jake LaMotta said, I didn't go down. He lost so bad they called it the Valentine's Day Massacre and Jake LaMotta didn't say I won, he didn't say I lost. He got beat to death almost, he said, but I didn't go down. The biggest problem, and you guys are not going to like it, one of the biggest problems, you talk about the UFC, you don't like the UFC, you don't like this, but the average male boxing fan has been effeminized. You have been effeminized. I read many of your comments, and many of your comments make me sick. Not all, but some. When you start talking about, oh, well, it's a game of boxing, hitting and not being hit, you didn't say that when you were a Mike Tyson fan. You didn't say that when you used to rush home to see Mike Tyson, an undersized fighter, an undersized heavyweight, go and destroy people that were 6'5". Why would Mike Tyson go and want to fight Razor Ruddock, a man who he said is the hardest punch he ever faced? Why would he want to go and fight Razor Ruddock like he fought Razor Ruddock? Why would he want that? Because he's a fighter. Look at one of the greatest boxers of all time, fighters of all time, who is a boxer, one of the greatest fighters and boxers of all time, who really is in the top 10 fighters, heavyweight fighters ever. And he was always undersized. Who, when you would announce his name, he would grin. Evander, the real deal, Holyfield. He would be grinning before he shed anybody's blood and before blood was shed by him or blood was shed on him, he would be grinning. Before he's getting ready to fight Mike Tyson. Yes, he beat Mike Tyson twice, but do not forget, he was an odds-on underdog to lose to Mike Tyson because Evander looked so bad against Bobby Chairs the fight before that. And when they announced his name, before he's getting ready to fight this bonafide killer in Mike Tyson, he got a grin on his face. 
An underdog, he has a grin on his face. Why? Not only because he thought he would win, but because of what it's going to say to the people to have him as an underdog get in there with this man and stand toe to toe when other people couldn't do it. Fighting. You are competing against yourself for what it says about you. That's what a fighter does. If he ends up winning, good. But it says something about himself. Through the blood, through the gore, through the sweat, through the snot, through the slob. And if those things are not part and parcel of a particular match, he gets bored with it because it doesn't push him. It is a waste of his time. There is no avoidance of the best opponent. There is a search and a preference for the best opponent. There is no avoidance for exchanging. There is a need and an addiction to exchange. Even when you can box, you don't want to box. Even when you can jab, you don't want to jab. Even when you can punch, you rather get punched. Now that sounds crazy to a lot of people, but that's what fighters are about. When you talk to a fighter, a fighter will tell you that. They just maybe don't articulate it in the way that I articulated it. They maybe not don't verbalize it in the way I verbalized it. But when I say a person is not a fighter, that's what I'm talking about. Looking for the best available opportunity. A person who is just as capable of rendering you unconscious as you are of rendering them unconscious, that is a fighter. It is a high. It is an addiction. That's what it is. It is not merely winning and losing. To win or lose takes away from the whole thing. Because winning and losing is the only thing you want to do. The easiest, the patsy, the Joe Palooka, the plug, the plug nickel you can get, the bum you can get, give them all to me. I don't care. I will not politicize it. I will not, I will not antagonize you. I will not argue about these people you were picking out for me. Bring them all. I will knock them all down. It's not my fault. It's the promoter's fault. It's not my fault. It's the manager's fault. A fighter says, no, no. If you can't get me the best competition, I will fire you as my trainer. If you can't get me the best competition, I will go to another promoter. If you can't get me the best competition, I will go to another manager. Like for silly Lomachenko. Lomachenko wanted to fight Nicholas Waters. Nicholas Waters messed up and lost to another guy. He said, well, you're out. When you win, I'll fight you. He wants to fight Rigadal. Lomachenko wants to fight Rigadal. How many fights did Lomachenko had? A half a dozen? A dozen? He wants to fight Rigadal. Guillermo Rigadal. He wants to fight Gamboa. Many of you right now are saying, ah, oh, he'll beat this guy. He'll beat that guy. He's telling you he don't care whether he wins or loses. He wants to win, but he wants to test himself against the best, and he wants to do it now. He doesn't wait till he's 30 after 30 like, like um, his... um. Like his, his countryman, Gennady Gennuffkin. He doesn't want to wait till he's had 30 fights. He wants to do it now. That's what it's about. Fighting is fighting against yourself. It's pushing yourself. Through the blood, through the gore, through the sweat. Yes, I'm going to say it again so you understand. So you can get before, beyond the rudimentary explanation that tends to kind of jive things in your mind. Go behind the idea. Go behind the words. A fighter wants the very best. A fighter gets to the point where he has a sadistic, a sadistic attraction to indulging in violence with another person equally trained as himself with at least a 50-50 chance of defeating him. That's what a fighter does. Anything less than that, a fighter gets bored. It's a waste of their time. Winning is a cherry is just a cherry on a cake. That's what it is. A fighter indulges. In violent, controlled acts for what it says about existentially about himself. Pushing and competing only against himself. That's what a fighter is. Winning and losing is something that is part and parcel of that. But a fighter thoroughly understands that if he continues to push and continues to push the envelope, and if he learns to stomach those things that makes another man vomit, if he learns to look at those things that makes another man blink, if he looks to smile at things that makes another man cringe, if he looks to welcome things that makes another man want to escape, then winning by virtue of pushing yourself and pushing your opponent further than he is willing to go, winning more than not will be the case. 
Manny Pacquiao has been a fighter. Has he won more than he lost? Absolutely. But you can look at his smile. It ain't about winning. It's about pushing himself for what? Surviving. The snot, the blood, the cuts, the sweat. For what? Surviving that and not looking for an escape. Not looking for a way out. Not looking for somebody throwing a towel. What it says about you as an individual. You see that in the UFC. You see that in Muay Thai. You see that in bare knuckle in Europe. You are not seeing that in boxing today. And one of the reasons why you will not see it in boxing anytime soon is because of the effeminate position that many so-called men, and we are not talking about sexual preference. We are talking about your character. Today's boxing fan, the male boxing fan's character, allows for people, people like Gennady Genufkin to avoid Andre Ward on the basis of it's about business. Boxing has always been about business, but we still saw Marvelous Marvin Hagler versus Thomas Hermans. We still saw Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier. We still saw Larry Holmes versus Ken Norton. We still saw Manny Pacquiao versus Juan Manuel Marquez, Eric Morales, Mar uh, Barrera. We still saw all these fights. It's always been about money, but at one point in time, boxing was about character. And one fighter wanting to test himself against the best opposition. Uma Fight Camp, Save Carmen. Train hard, train smart. See you in the next video.